Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blue Star Rising Templar Awakening. Michael Henry Dunn here with the one and only Reverend Maya Nartumit. Hey there, Maya. Hello. All right. So uh, this is a fun one today. I mean, they're all fun. What could be more fun than cosmic, sacred, quantum, science, revelations week after week? Well, month after month, every couple of times. But anyway, so um, this is a subject near and dear to... Um, both Maya's heart and mine, and to millions of others besides, and that is the one and only Elvis Presley. And uh, so today we have a chance to uh, share with you and explore Maya's wonderful book, Blue Star Love from um, Heart of Grace. And it's, it's something that both Maya and I have really been uh, immersed in, uh, deeply over the last year or so um, because of the project that this book um, has now become. We'll tell you about that later. And it's essentially the um, the spiritual history of Elvis Presley um, supported um, by letters and transcripts and stories um, previously unavailable, many of these stories. And... Um, and also infused with much of Maya's own um, received material from the Thoth extreme of her own perceptions about the soul of, of Elvis Presley, his, um, the whole metaphysical picture and, and history, and then brought forward into uh, this wonderful book, which is greatly supported by the, transcripts provided by uh, Wanda June Berryhill, um, who was a confidant of Elvis's uh, for many years and was allowed to um, make recordings of their private conversations about, not just about spiritual matters, um, but about many things. And so, um, Maya, wh why don't we start out, we're, we're going to share in, in a moment here a brief video which for people familiar with them, uh, is essentially what is known these days in the business as you know as a um, um, a, a book promotional um, video on YouTube, and it it shares um, an overview of what you know what is in the book. But as a preface to that, Maya, I think it would be great to engage all of our friends out there with your own brief description before we share the video of it doesn't have to be brief. We got all the time in the world of how, how the reality of Elvis first came into your life, what, how that changed you when you and your mother actually saw him in person and an, an you know, an overview of your relationship with him in the, some 36 concerts that you attended and and how that led to the book can we can we do that as an entree here yeah um okay well um you know i was first aware of him when i was six and i told my mother it, i felt something very different about him i those weren't the exact words but that was the the gist of it and of course this was during the time when i was having my experiences in astral travel inside the desert mountain with the now I know ultra beings who were showing me computers and all of this. So this was concurrent with that period of time. Uh, and I don't think that that was coincidental. So um, that was my first recognition of him. I would, didn't become an Elvis fan. I just, I was six years old, but you know, I, I, I noticed this and I said, there's, you know, this is special, this person. And um, so that's when it began, but, um, you know, when I was about, oh, I don't know, 12, I discovered him more as a, you know, a teenager. And, um, and still, I didn't have that, you know, I wasn't quite in it like all the teenagers were. But uh, I, you know, I bought the records and I watched the movies and I thought, oh, he's so beautiful and he sings so sweetly, you know. And um, so that grew into, and when I started doing my, in earnest, doing my spiritual work, I was 20, well, at the time, <clears throat> you know, I was like 16 and then 17, 18, 20, 21, 22. And in there, um, you know, I began to see him 
as a, 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 a spiritual mystical figure. That's just how I was. I was looking at the Akasha. I was being guided by my sources and, and that was in the picture along with everything else. So I thought, oh, that's the reason, you know, I feel this way about this individual. So then my mother and I went to Las Vegas for the first time in 1969 to see him. And that was the turning point. I mean, we both saw the aura come out of his body. You know, I mean, there was these lights coming out of his head. It wasn't spotlights. And, and uh, his stage presence was unbelievable. Um, and it was so pure, and so spiritual. You know, he wasn't just a great performer. He was, of course. But uh, there was this other thing about him. It was like seeing a guru or something. And we recognized that immediately. And in fact, standing in the long, long, long lines we had to stand in, no matter what time of day we got there, to be able to get into the showroom, we talked to people, you know, in the line. And, um, and, and uh, almost everybody there was seeing him like 20 times or something. They'd come for a month, you know, as much money as they could save up in a year. Um, and so they said, they would say, you see those lights around his head? <laughs> You know, they were like, what is that? You know, it wasn't the spotlight. They didn't even know anything about ours, these particular individual young girls in, in 1969, you know. So we'd have to kind of explain it to them. They go, oh, okay. <laughs> so um, that, you know, that, that progressed. And so then when I wrote my book, Red Tree, about uh, Lemuria and Atlantis, uh, that would have been 1972, I believe. Um, and I went to Vegas again to see him because, as I said, we saw him 37 times and all, and that was through, through the years. Um, I gave him the book on stage. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to sit up front, and I gave him the book. And um, then he looked at could that cover. That? Could you stop and describe that? How did that happen, that you gave him the book and he took it? Well, you know, all, you tip the ma waiter, not the waiter, the mater D, mater D, is that what we call, uh, and you get up front, you know. And oh, in those days, you only had to tip $100. I mean, I can imagine if that it was not more than it is now, yeah. But, you know, and we got the seat up front. And we, we learned how to do this from 69 to 72. We learned how to, how to do this. And my mother was real good at that. And so uh, she was the one that did all the wheeling to get me where I needed to go through life. She did that for me. And so, so we got up front, you know, and I had the book. And you have to picture this for a minute, okay? I was 23, 4, 5, 6, 7. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. How old would I have been in 72? I'm um, doing the math. Oh, well, it was probably 26 or 27, okay? And so... Um, and I was really small and I had really curl, I had curled, you know, red hair, bright red hair. And I had little, little puffy sleeve, nice little white dress on. And I just, <laughs> and it was so incongruent. So red -haired I, you know, <laughs> you, you wouldn't expect this little thing to say, look at my book. <laughs> And on the book cover, of course, Red Tree had all these symbols. And eight, you know, I'd drawn these symbols and everything on the cover. And I did not know, see, I had no inkling that Elvis was deeply metaphysical. He'd even, he was a member of, you know, Yogananda's fellowship. And, uh, you know, he was being mentored by the head of the fellowship, Diamata, and that he'd studied for years and years and years all of this stuff. And he had a thousand books in his library that were just on spiritual metaphysical topics. And I'm talking about deep books that he'd underlined and written in and all of this. I didn't know that. I was just being guided that this would be the right thing to do, that he wouldn't go, eh, you know, and toss it over his shoulder. So... There I was, and, and before I gave him the book, Janie, Janie Steele, I'll never forget her, if she's listening to this, she may still be among us, I don't know, um, who was the photo one of the photographer girls, they had pretty little girls going, take your picture for $20, you know, and around the showroom, and she happened to peek over my shoulder, and she saw that book, she said, oh, are you going to give that to Elvis? And I said, yes, she said, oh, yes, she said, he's so into that sort of thing, and I went, really? Because she knew him personally. She talked to him and went up to the, you know, she, she knew it. And she said, oh, yes, yes, yes. He's deeply in the metaphysical spiritual. And I was going, oh, my God. You know, I was so excited. 
so uh, he he comes out and you know and and I'm and so he's kissing the girls and all I'm thinking about is giving him this book and I so I uh, you know I hold it up and he just goes you know he walks right over to it he takes the book and he's almost going to walk away. oh oh you know where are my manners you know <laughs> he turns around and he gives me a kiss and but he was almost like just going to ignore me because he had this book in his hands you know so. Um, there's a larger story to that. And I'm going to skip ahead for just a moment uh, because when I met Wanda, well, wait a minute, I'm not going to go there yet. Okay. So, cause then I'd have to tell more. All so right. Anyway. Well, I, can, I can perhaps just thumbnail as a segue into the video at this point, or if there is there a part you want to share. No, that's okay. Uh, you know, you asked for my story. <laughs> it just keeps going. I did. Well, you know, um, as a prelude to what we will share in more detail later, this was not the only exchange that Maya had with Elvis from the stage. Uh, you've also shared about how you communicated clairvoyantly um, yes. with him from the stage and that you verified that. You tested it and he proved it for yeah. you. Yeah, uh, well, that's we'll the We'll go more into that later. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, let me just say about the book that uh, Maya has shared that there were uh, specific instructions from Colonel Parker, Elvis's manager, to keep metaphysical material away from him, to try to dampen his spiritual enthusiasm because they were afraid that he was going to go off the spiritual deep end and become a monk or a minister, which in fact he wanted to do and spoke of doing. He even spoke to Sri Dayamara, the woman who succeeded Paramahansa Yogananda as the head of Self-Realization Fellowship in a private meeting with her, expressed his desire to leave show business and become a monk. And she said, Elvis, in this life, you are Elvis Presley. You're not going to be Brother Elvis in our monastery. God, God made you Elvis. This is the light you are bringing. So, um, so, you know, so Colonel Parker's regime had specific instructions to keep stuff like that away from Elvis. And the danger in giving him spiritual material from the stage is that one of the Memphis Mafia would go, oh, here, Elvis, I'll take that. He'd never see it again. But um, he did not only see the book that Maya gave him again, but um, he kept it. He read it through. He would read aloud from the book to friends of his. And uh, at the end of his life, he gave Wanda a list of, of the thousand books he had read, the 22 most important, most influential books that he had ever read. And among them were Yogananda's autobiography, Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly Palmer Hall, and Red Tree by Christine Hayes, the one and only Maya Nartuman. So um, this was not just a, you know, happenstance, accidental, oh, the nice cute fan is giving me a book, isn't that sweet? Um, there was a, a an important relationship here which has led to this beautiful book. So we're gonna share with you now, um, just a four minute, um, overview of some of the material from the book. This was created by Maya uh, some years ago when she first published the book. So um, please enjoy that. It's just about four minutes and we'll be right back with you to explore.
All right, welcome back. So what we'd like to share with you right off here is a um, excerpt from the book, from the foreword, which was written by Wanda June Berryhill, sharing how she came to become a friend of Elvis's and how and when she knew that the spiritual material that he had shared with her in their private conversations, which were recorded, was meant to be given to Maya to, to write this book because she recognized that Maya and Elvis not only spoke the same language, they described the same realities. And that Wanda said, I, this book is not for me to write. You were the one who can write the story of the soul of Elvis. And so it was when Wanda wrote her own memoir shortly after his death that Maya read, got in touch with her, wrote her a letter, said how much you enjoyed your book. Wanda got back and said, whoa, are you the Christine Hayes who wrote Red Tree? Yeah. And she said, yes, I am. Well, that was a very important book to Elvis, and that's how your friendship with Wanda began. So um, do you want to just share with us, Maya, what the excerpt that you're about to read uh, yes. is about? This is, uh, we can discuss in a, just a bit uh, how Wanda met Elvis, and I can extemporize, if I think that's the right word, about it, uh, because it's kind of a long story to read. But what I'm going to read to you is what she has to say about her connection with me. In 1980, Maya Christine Nartumid, then Christine Hayes, wrote to me after reading the book compiled by myself, several members of my family, and some friends, all of whom had a personal relationship with Elvis Presley. I answered her letter, she wrote again, and we began corresponding off and on uh, for a couple of years. She sent me several booklets which she published that contain various information given to her through a type of channeling, most of which was out of my realm of understanding. However, as I continued to read these materials, I realized that many of the things she wrote about, Elvis mentioned to me, and some of what he said closely followed what she was relating in her works. It was as if a light suddenly turned on in my memory, almost as if he were speaking to me again. At first, knowing of his sincerity, and of the ridicule and disdain he had received concerning his metaphysical interests from those closest to him during his last years of life, I was hesitant to reveal anything he had mentioned to me about it. I didn't want to bring further disrespect to his memory. But as Maya's and my own trust and friendship grew, I felt compelled to tell her what he had related to me. Once I began, it poured out as if that were the intent all along. Maya immediately began putting together a book based on her knowledge and Elvis's impressions and wisdom gleaned from this spiritual quest and that of his own experiences, both during his life as Elvis and the many past lives which he felt he had lived and which Maya's channeling source could recount as well. Amazingly, what he had told me and what her sources revealed matched in many ways, explaining why Elvis was Elvis and why so many people of all ages and circumstances felt and still feel such a rapport with him. Somehow Elvis knew that in time I would pass on the things that meant so much to him. And so he seeded my mind, knowing that time would bring fertile ground in which to plant those seeds. Maya did just that, the collecting and compiling information that she put into her book, then called Magi from the Blue Star, which was the original title. In doing this work, Maya has given Elvis what he truly desired, a chance to share his thoughts, his knowledge and beliefs with everyone who would like to know the real Elvis, the man behind the myth. Now I understand and I am at rest with my own question, why me? Thank you, Maya. So this was very moving to me. And um, I'm going to share just briefly, because it, as I said, it's a much longer story. You can read it in my book, how Wanda met Elvis. Um, and it's quite a story. Uh, she was actually going through a 
a time of great depression in her life. There was no real reason for it. Uh, she had a two, uh, about a three or four year old little daughter. She had a happy marriage and a good life in, in uh, LA. But and she was very young. She was 23, 24 at the time, something like that. But she was depressed. Perhaps it was a long postpartum or who knows, you know, she was really, really depressed. And, um, but, you know, she was being her, she was doing her job and that was to take care of her child, be there for her husband. And so she went to do the laundry. She didn't have a washing machine. So she went to the laundromat where she went, you know, and her daughter was with her. So little, little Julie, it was Ju- Julie Starla was, she gal goes by Starla, but then she went by Julie. And so Julie was playing on the floor or whatever, you know, while mom was waiting for the laundry. And there's another woman comes to sit down about Starla's, about Wanda's age. And she has a little girl about the same age as Starla. So, you know, they're playing together. So, of course, the mothers start talking, right? And they say, what do you do? Well, what do you do? You know, that sort of thing. And the other lady says, well, I'm an extra in movies. And I'm just finishing up a movie with Elvis Presley. And he's going to call me tonight. And she turns to, to Wanda, whom they sort of gotten chummy by then, and says, would you like to come over to my house and maybe Elvis will talk to you? And Starla's going, eh, I don't really like Elvis Presley. She's thinking this in her mind. You know, I, I don't know much about him. She was born, she was raised a Southern Baptist, and they said Elvis was of the devil, so she never got to listen to him. <laughs> and so she thought, I, I don't think so. And she almost started to say, no, thank you. And then she thought, oh, but my husband, Jimmy, gosh, Jimmy just loves Elvis. Not like he, you know, buys all his records and put pictures on his walls, but, you know, he, he, he really likes him. She thought, okay, well, I better do it for Jimmy. So she said, yes. So she, Jimmy was ecstatic when she got home and told him that she was going that night, you know. And so she goes to the woman's house and one thing leads to another. And she gets to talk to this man who's supposed to be Elvis on the other end of the line. This is a regular telephone, you know. And uh, she starts talking. She goes, my God, this is just amazing. She, the feeling she got. Now, again, this is not, she's not impressed about talking with Elvis Preston. She doesn't even know if it really is him. But it was just the energy of this other human being on the other side of the phone. It was like, wow, you know, and she was deeply moved by what he had to say and, and all of this, even though they just met, you know, they were just talking to strangers. So the conversation finishes before it does. Elvis said, I'd like to give you my phone number. Now, let me explain this. Elvis was not, um, you know, trying to snare her as a girlfriend or anything. He loved having people t- to talk to who did not treat him like a star, like Elvis Presley, especially women who were not trying to, you know, get him. And she was obviously just being a per- being herself, you know. He knew she was married. He knew she had a little girl. And he loved that. He loved to have women friends who were happily married. And he liked to have the husbands as friends, too, and the children as friends. This was something that was really deep in his heart. So right away, he thought, oh, a happily married woman who doesn't even care if I'm Elvis Presley or not. I want to know her. So he gave her his, his private phone number. And she took it. And she said when she drove home, and it was quite a long way, she doesn't remember it. It's just like missing time, like she was abducted by aliens or something. And she gets home and she's going, my God, you know, she's looking at the clock and, and she doesn't even know how she got back there. Again, she wasn't even convinced this was Elvis, right? So she comes in the house and, you know, she tells Jimmy, here's, you know, this is what he, and she, oh, call him, call him. She says, no, I don't think so. I mean, really, is, if this is Elvis Presley, is he really going to answer when, you know? And so she waited two weeks and Jimmy was pestering her. So finally she said, okay, I'll call him. And she did. And of course, Elvis answered. And they continued their friendship. And then I always got to know Jimmy and got to know little Julie. He said, put Julie on the phone. You know, little Julie, <laughs> he's talking to her and she's answering him. And they had this long conversation with a three-year-old or four-year-old, whatever she was at the time. So, um, and then he'd say, oh, you know, I have a friend. You just, you, you would really like this person. It was another phone friend. So he put her in touch with that person. These people were young, they were old, They were men, they were women, they were little children, they were really old, (laughs) all mixtures of people. So she got to know at least 16 or more 
uh, of these other people. And those are the main people. And they had, you know, they had family that were all involved as well. Because Elvis didn't leave any family members out. He wanted to pick them off one by one. He got to know uh, Wanda's mother and, you know, so on. So anyway, that's how that happened. And she knew him from 1963 until his passing in 1977. She uh, got to be in his presence physically in, in his home or wherever to talk to him personally only about six times all that period of time. But she did, but th that was about it. The other times were all on the phone. Um, so now, one of the main reasons that Wanda just turned over the transcripts to me, not all of her transcripts, but the ones that related, you know, that she felt needed to go in this book from the taped conversations. And the taped conversations were all done with his permission. Some of them were actually in person. And that's another story. But anyway, she, you know, the reason she gives a reason here, and this is a valid, and this is true, but there was a crowning moment with all of this. And that was that when she read in my material that I sent her that Elvis's soul came from the blue star Rigel in Orion. She knew that I, you know, I was genuine because Elvis had told her that and she had recorded it in 1970, but he'd actually told her previously in 1967, I think it was, or 66. Um, so no one knew that. I mean, she, she didn't even share that with her, the other phone friends because she thought, well, you know, it's kind of far out. They weren't all metaphysical or anything, you know. So she just kept it. And maybe her husband listened to it. And that was about it, you know. So she knew I couldn't know that. And he says, Blue Star Rigel, Orion. He points it out to her in the sky. So that is what sort of sealed the deal, you might say. Okay, so I'd like to read to you now just a very just a little short excerpt here from the book. And you know, Wanda wrote me a lot of letters when she knew I was doing the book. Not, so it's not just the transcripts of Elvis talking, but letters from Wanda, remembrances of hers, you know, and experiences that she had with him. And so um, here we are, just a moment, let me find that. Here we go. Um, here we go. So she said, this is from Wanda's letter to me. I remember Elvis saying so seriously in 1966 and with a look in his eyes like I have never seen before that he was from the blue planet. He called it a blue star and he was sent from there to earth and he thought he was instilled into his mother's womb along with her natural son, which was Elvis's twin, Jesse, who died at birth. And that Jesse chose to die, giving Elvis a path to an earth life. And he always had visions, even as a child, and felt that he was somehow magical and not of this earth, and was held to earth to bring some new understanding and love to its people, to guide them to a higher realm of spiritual awareness through music or energy transmitted by music and that he was doomed because he could not adjust to Earth's gravity and pressure. It was burning him up. And Elvis's normal temperature was over 100 degrees, and this is something a lot of people knew. Um, she continues, he was transformed, became different as he talked. It was dark, no moon at all, and late, and he was lit as if from within. Now, they were sitting outside in the backyard in the lawn chairs looking up at the sky. And that's when he pointed out his, his star, you know. His eyes shone out of his head like miniature neon lights. He touched me, and it was like getting an electrical shock from the tips of his fingers. I was almost spooked by him, but there was a feeling of comforting warmth, of a good nature that overtook the anxiousness I experienced. He talked fast, he sounded more Southern, and he gestured, shaping his hands differently than he did when just talking, almost as if using some kind of sign language. He began talking about all the things of his planet, the blue star. He talked about the distance, time travel, astral projection, and how his people astral projected to Earth and have for millions of years, but they can't do too much as they are nebulous forms without substance and can't be felt. Some people can see them, only those who come 
to earth as and have taken human forms can see those who have not. And he goes on and on about the planet and how his home looked when he lived there. And it's all here in the book, but I'm just going to read you that part. So that was that. And then there's one other thing that's really critical here about the blue star that I'd like to share. It's not as long. I'm not going to read that much of it. But, um, and this is on, on uh, I, I have the tape that this is on. So I've heard it many, many times over. Um, so he starts to talk about, he said, did you ever hear Rigel? Now see, before he talked about it, but he didn't name it. He didn't say Rigel, he called it the blue star. Now he's giving it a name and this is in 1970. And, um, and this was Tate. So he says, have you ever hear, did you ever hear it? And she said, no, is it a country or a person? And he said, a place, my home is near there, my other home, where I am from, and I have the blue star for my son. I have eight moons in the mansion beneath the outer shell of my planet. You think I'm making this up, but it's true. You'll know that one day. You'll remember what I told you before you, you die. You'll see some of it happen, and you'll be involved because you and I are tied together. And you don't know it, but I do. I can't tell you how. Don't remember it, but I feel it in my heart, in my inner self. And so do you. And the interesting thing about this is that when I had this manuscript and it was read by years later in the 1990s by a woman who had somehow gotten, because I would put out the manuscript for people to read and it got into other people's hands, you know. And this woman I did not know who was, um, wrote to me and she was an older woman at the time. So I don't know if she's still alive. Um, her name was Mary, and she was a former former embassy hostess in Washington, D.C. Now, before I get to this, the material that I sent, the channeling, if you want to call it that, that I received from, from Thoth about the, the migrations of the souls from the blue star to planet Earth. Many of us are blue star solarians. And I, so I, I knew Elvis was one, and I knew I was one. It's not rare, rare, rare. You know, there are people out there, they're blue star solarians. So I said to him, both, I said, um, could you give me at least two more people that, you know, are in, in the spotlight that I would know about that are Blue Star Stellarians? And he said, okay, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Anwar Sadat. Anwar Sadat being the president of Egypt, you know, who was sadly assassinated years later. So, uh, so Mary enters the scene, okay? Mary, who is the, had been an embassy hostess in Washington, D.C. Now, she's an Elvis person, so she's reading this book, this manuscript. She goes, oh, my God, when she sees this, because she was a friend of Anwar Sadat. When he came to Washington, they met, they had, you know, and she had to be with him for a while, you know, well, they, they were setting up whatever he was going to do, and they got to talking very often. And so this is what she sent to me. Mary Kelly, in a letter to me, June 2nd, 1988, said, um, she wrote this letter to me after having read my manuscript, etc. I remember telling Anwar during one of our long conversations that I had always felt so spiritually drawn to both he and Elvis Presley, and that I had been blessed to meet and know him, but I never did get to meet and know Elvis. And I remember how he took my hand in his and said, my precious Mary, that does not at all surprise me. And you and Elvis and I are cut from the same star. We share the same heritage and we carry the same destinies. You will see. There will come a time when you will see and you will know the answer to this puzzle, to the spiritual drawing and longing one for the other. And I find these words eerily similar to what Elvis said to Wanda in 1970. You'll remember what I told you. Before you die, you'll see some of it happen. And you'll be involved because you and I are tied together. And you don't know it, but I do. I can't tell you how. I don't remember it. But I feel it in my heart, in my inner self, and so do you. Now, this is not in the book. It somehow got left out, but it's... It's part of the book, and it will be in the second volume, <laughs> the, the updated version. Wow. So, you know, that's so compelling. And 
and undeniable. I've heard the tape myself, you know, and uh, here in the San Luis Valley, we have a beautiful view of the stars and Orion is very present in the winter skies right now. And Rigel is that bright star that is at the tip of the sword of Orion below the three famous stars of the belt. You look down and there's Rigel. Um, Betelgeuse is the other star in Orion that's up at the top, which is slightly brighter than Rigel, but Rigel is one of the brightest stars in the sky. And it is, there's, there's a whole other story that, that we've shared with all of you about the um, origin of the ensoulment of our planet and, and of a migration from, um, from the blue star. And that's a different topic that you know, you know, you'll see on, on one of our other programs. And it's the reason for the name of this channel, Blue Star Rising, the Templar Awakening, because it is so much the dynamic, uh, the heart really of, of what we're sharing here. Um, you know, some of it from my background and experience, but very much, of course, um, a lot of it from Maya Stealth Extreme and her work over many years. And, you know, if it has a central dynamic to it, um, it is this awakening, and we call it the Templar awakening. Um, Elvis believed himself to be part of the higher Templar lineage on this planet. And that's, you know, it's a very moving thing to us. We are, you know, of the Johannine Templar lineage here in Creston. And so it, you know, it's, um, it's a powerful bond and, and also just a vista, if you will, that opens onto this huge metaphysical horizon of what's going on on the planet, uh, not just metaphysically in terms of what people call the Ascension dynamic or the Ascension timeline, but also has, you know, geopolitical ramifications, um, quantum spiritual science ramifications. And so it feels really good and important to be sharing this with everybody right now um, at this particular moment. Um, you know, we do have a, a related project to Maya's book that we're working on, which we'll share more about at the appropriate time. And so maybe this is a good moment to share the second video, Maya? Yes, it's also very short, a little over four minutes long. And this one really focuses on Elvis's encounters with otherworldly beings, spiritual beings, you know. Right. So uh, this one's about four minutes long, right? A little over. They're both a little over. Uh, up to yeah. five. Let's say under five. Uh, so this is, um, is, you know, documented incidents of Elvis's um, encounters with spiritual beings, UFOs, etc. So mm -hmm. please enjoy. We'll be right back.
All right, so we are back. Yeah, you know, we're incorporating all this material into the a life that everybody thinks they know. Oh, it's Elvis. Yeah, you know, shaking his hips on Ed Sullivan and did a lot of lousy movies and then he died, you know, in that sad way. Uh, no, this is one of the great souls of our time and his impact uh, continues to be felt in so many ways. So Maya, you, you um, said you feel, felt prompted to share uh, some other material that- Well, I just wanted to talk about my experience yeah. because I didn't just give him that one thing from the stage. I saw him in 19, 1969, 1972, 73, and 75. Those were the years that I saw him in live. And each time we saw, we went to several shows, of course. I don't, uh, so it, that plus, oh, well, then I went to, saw him in, in um, uh, Reno, Nevada, not Reno. Was it Reno? No, Lake Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, uh, and for several shows. And then they were on tour in San Antonio, where we were living at the time, in Phoenix. So it added up to about 37 shows, as I recall. Uh, and I wasn't giving him things in every show, but of course, but nevertheless, at least on, I don't know, five or six occasions, maybe, I gave him things from the stage. What I gave him wasn't teddy bears and bow ribbons or anything. It was it was uh, my material, you know, first the book. And then, um, I, as an example, I received about one of his incarnations as a uh, someone, a male who worked who was in the Great Pyramid at the time when 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 souls were little people were literally lying in the sarcophaga guy uh, looked a lot different then because it's now it's just an empty stone box but it had you know lots in there and they would lie in it and they would literally would allow them to be transported to other dimensions uh, and not just uh, it, it was it was more than just, you know, having an astral trip. I won't go into the whole details of it. But anyway, he was one of the ones who facilitated that. And so um, I wrote something up on that. And I actually had a little cheapo metal engraved because I had seen in my mind's eye the, the metal that he wore. Of course, it wouldn't look like a little cheap metal, but I put the, you know, I had the symbols engraved on it that matched the symbols that I saw in this metal. So I uh, had the the information type, typed by me, and I put it in a regular little folder, you know, a little manila folder thing, you know, and I had, I wasn't thinking what I was doing. I put the necklace on top of that. So I was gonna hand him the folder and the little necklace thing, you know, was a pendant with a chain on it, on the top. So he comes for the, and he's been getting things for me already. And so he comes expectantly and I hand him this thing and he's going like this, cause the metal's about to fall off of the paper on top of it and he's doing this little dance of course everybody's laughing you know it was kind of cute but I gave him other things as well and every time he saw me in the audience it was like oh she's gonna give me something you know because I was stage side and he knew that if I was stage side he was gonna get something so um he would not come directly to me and he would be he'd look at sides like this and he'd do something else and then he'd look at me and then he'd look over there I knew he was waiting to see his moment when the Gestapo didn't see him take it and um then like one time he would he walked over he, he I could tell he was communicating with me not elaborately but you know like one time he looked at me and then he walked away and he, he, he it was like the, the message was I'll be back I'll be back and then he's and then he'd say, I'm coming now. And he'd turn around and walk toward me. And I thought, well, that's just a coincidence. You know, and this happened, I don't remember how many times, but things happen, you know, and and I, I just felt this man's communicating with me. And so one time when he leaned down to kiss me and I took take what it was, he was this close to me, I just said in my mind, Are you really communicating with me? And he went like that. It was very slight, but I didn't miss it because he was right here. He just went like that. So, um, you know, that was pretty cool. <laughs> but I, I do know that some of the things I gave him were taken from him because Janie, my friend, the photographer, she was behind stage and I was standing there with something I'd given him. He was just like this. And, jo and a person, I'm not going to say who, one of his people came over and just said, what you got there, Elvis? And just took it away from him. And he was like, like this. So I don't know if he was able to get it back or not. 
But uh, then I had an encounter with Colonel Parker because nothing went past Colonel Parker. He saw this little redhead in the front that was kept coming back and giving Elvis these things with these mystical symbols and all this stuff. And he was like, I don't like this. And uh, so one day I was coming into the showroom. I'd actually gone to the restroom before the show started, coming back to my seat, you know, hurried up, walking down. And all of a sudden, boom, Colonel Parker standing right in front of me. And he just stands there and he just glares at me. I want to tell you, it was a glare, you know, just glares at me. And he doesn't stay there long. One, two, three, four, and then he's gone. He just walks away. So, but I'm so fortunate, I'm so happy in my heart that he did get these things. Most of them he was able to keep, and they meant something to him. And I know they did because of the book and what happened with that, but also because of the look on his face when he would come to receive these things in our communication. And you also share with us the things that, you received from him, not directly, but oh. Rwanda. If you could, you know, share um, yeah. the story of oh. some of the yeah. items, you know, the ring, the, the tiki god, the things like that. But first, I want to tell you what I did receive. What right. I did receive from him, and that, of course, was the red scarf that he gave me in 1972. And the the um, interesting thing about that was that he, you know, we'd been doing this back and forth for a while before that happened. And I didn't grab for it or anything, of course not. He came over and he said, look, I'm gonna give you this. You know, he was looking at me and he, he, and I just held out my hands. It was a red scarf and in a way it seemed like a communion. I held out my hands like this and it just flowed. It was like all in slow motion. And the interesting thing is, you know, the showroom, Elvis Presley, when Elvis is going down and he's giving kisses and getting his car, screams, yells, you know, it's chaos, okay? When he came up to me and he went very slowly and he started, and he took that scarf very, very slowly, intentionally, and I did this and the scarf came down in my hands, you could have heard a pin drop. There was not a single sound. There was one woman sitting next to me that was going, like that. That was all I heard. It was Im impossible, but it happened that way. And of course, once I received it, I put it to my breast, I nodded, he nodded, and then chaos again. You know, It was like a time out of time. So um, that, that was something he gave me. The other items Wanda gave me, she gave me some of his books that have underlinings in it and whatever that are in my book, uh, photocopies, and, and then, you know, discussion about it. And um, he al she also gave me his lucky tiki god that appears very, very briefly in his movie, Roused About. Um, but it wasn't just a lucky tiki god to him. He told her he meditated with it. Um, By the way, for those of you who <clears throat> want to check out Roused About, um, Maya has a, a clip. And I think it's Elvis is in, in the story. Elvis is uh, getting out of jail and they're giving him back the things that they took from him when he went into jail and uh, the sheriff's standing there and Elvis says, yeah, okay, here's my watch and here's my change. Oh, uh, here's my lucky tiki god. And yeah, you just see it for a second. Yeah, right. Can you show uh, it I have to it. us there? Huh? Can you show it to us there? Right, right, right. And in fact, when we uh, put this together, why don't you just slip in that little three second video? I'll send right, it to I'll you. I'll put in a little clip there. You send me the link. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it right here. Lucky tiki god. Lucky Tiki God. Lucky Tiki God. And why don't you tell us about the ring? I think we might have spoken about it in a previous program, but I think it deserves to be brought forward here. Yes, um, the ring. Well, there was a very mystical looking large ring, which I do not have anymore because Thoth requested that I give it to someone. And this was not a casual thing. And I was going, you want me to do what? <laughs> I was there. I was, yeah. I was passed yeah. up. And I, I did give it to that male individual uh, because I was instructed to. And I felt it had Elvis's blessing as well. So I don't have the ring. But um, but it's in the book. There's a picture of it in the whole story. It's in the book. And uh, it, it, it's, um, 
we don't really know where it comes from. The individual I gave it to thinks it might be something of Mexico. He thinks it has a Mexican seal on it or something, which is interesting. But actually, it was given to him by the head of the then uh, Order of Melchizedek. Um, it's an order that, uh, it's like, I think Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., if you remember him, that actor, he belonged to it. I f I've forgotten who else that Wanda told me that. Elvis told her it belonged to it, but some Hollywood people were joining this. But Elvis was very interested in it. Now, this wasn't his main calling. He, he was far more invested in, in spiritually in self-realization. But, you know, this was an additional thing he felt, he felt interest in, so he did join it. And the head of the place uh, gave him this ring, and he said, this is a very old ring, and it belonged to the original founder, and I want you to have it now. So Elvis took the ring, uh, and then um, he, at a certain period in time, uh, he felt he was not living up to uh, the order. I think he probably felt that way about self-realization as well. He, he was very, you know, he just felt like, well, I'm just not a good enough person. I'm not living up to this. I'm not spiritual enough. And mainly what was fueling that were certain individuals around him that were telling him that. And he was tending to believe it when they were pointing out his flaws. So um, he decided that he didn't, shouldn't keep the ring. He went back to the guy and said, you know, I just don't, I, I, I don't deserve this ring. You know, I want to give it back to you. He said, no, it's yours. It's your ring. So he kept it. And then toward the end of his life, he uh, gave it to Wanda. And she gave it to me. Well, in my care, and I gave didn't it. You, uh, uh, didn't you say, I remember that he felt, if I don't give this ring to you, they'll just throw it away. After yes, I, because it's they'll not. They'll throw an, it away after I'm gone because it's not valuable. It doesn't have gold or diamonds on it, but it's precious because of what it is. Mm -hmm. So I want you to have it so that it doesn't simply get thrown away or end up in some pawn shop or, you know, some. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, because you know Elvis was very, very ill. Had a lot of different illnesses. Yeah, and I have, I have seen the ring. I have, I have worn it briefly, <clears throat> and it's definitely got a vibration about it. Yeah. So, you know this. So, yeah, and um, I have my own precious memento that you gave me, which uh, um, I keep very uh, carefully. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, won't say what it is, except well, let, let's say this: it's um, it has a signature on it, and it is um, a, it. Well, I'll just leave it at that. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, so you know this, all these threads coming together the overall impact to the, the the importance the import the the significance of of Elvis's life is you know it's not as if there aren't people who who realize what an enormous impact he had but it's distorted and in in the popular mind he is not truly known for who he was he is not his impact is not truly recognized uh, of course, there's millions of fans around the world who love him and know that there was something special about him. There is this so-called cult of Elvis, of people who have altars, you might say, to Elvis. There's the candlelight vigils on on his birthday and on the anniversary of his death at, at Graceland and elsewhere. There's the many reports of him appearing to people um, around the time of his death, before his death, after his death. Credible sane, well-balanced people who had visitations from Elvis. Reports, you know, from um, during Desert Storm in 1991 of Elvis showing up to soldiers on the battlefield. He was in the U.S. Army. It meant something to him. He was a, he was a patriot of this country, but he refused to be drawn into politics. However, he did take a stand around his admiration for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He did take a stand when 
he was going to play Houston and was told by the management of the Astrodome, well, you know, you can leave those colored girl singers of yours. We don't, you know, really need. So he chose to enter the Astrodome for that gig in Houston. Said, here's how we're going to enter. We're going to have a big, huge convertible, gorgeous convertible, driven by a pretty blonde white girl driving it. And in the back seat is going to be me and my backup singers. These beautiful black women who are my dear soul sister friends. And I'm going to drive all the way around the field of the Astrodome waving at everybody, right? And you saw that. You were there, weren't you? Yes, but he didn't, he had his own car. They had their car. So it was even more special because he, he was standing up in his little red car coming around. Oh. And then came the little blonde driving the, the Sweet Inspirations who had their own car. They had their own car. Oh, so they, the blonde white girl was driving the the black women singers. Yes, yes. And it was their car. So it wasn't like, oh, well, they were there with Elvis. He came in with his car, and then they came in with their car. So, yeah, that's just like, okay, you know, Houston Astrodome promoters, this is the deal here. So, well, he told them he wouldn't come. He said, well, if, that, if they're going to stay home, so am I. So they said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, changed. right. It's like, you know, the Beatles did the same thing. They... Um, revolutionized. Uh, they integrated big stadium tours in in '64 when they refused to play for segregated audiences. They didn't want to have a riot, so that okay, well, I guess Tallahassee's going to see an integrated concert. Um, but anyway, so you know, so um, Elvis has as a as a patriot um, who was above politics and who, in his person, in who he was in terms of his heritage, his lineage, his bloodline, his genetics. It's documented. We're not making this up. It's, you know, his DNA has been analyzed. And he definitely had what's called Melungeon lineage, which is a blend of Cherokee and African. So he was Cherokee and he was black. Through his mother, he was Jewish. There's a Star of David on her gravestone at Graceland. Elvis said, no, we're going to put a Star of David because of my mother's Jewish. He put both the cross and the Star of David. Cross and the Star of David. And, uh, and of course, through his father, he was Scotch-Irish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's another thing. We've recently been in touch um, with a woman who um, is from Memphis and her family um, – I think, but her father or something, I won't mention her name because I haven't run past her, were dentists and was Elvis's dentist. Elvis would come to the dentist and um, Jewish family. Yeah, it was her and grandfather, her grandfather. That grandfather, was right. And, <laughs> right. And that um, Elvis specifically chose to cultivate his Jewish heritage um, in various ways in Memphis. And then when he would show up, okay, we're going to have to be drilling on your teeth, Elvis, you know, here's the Novocaine. He said, don't need the Novocaine. Just let me close my eyes a second. And he just put himself into a trance and dull the nerve endings in his own jaw through meditative withdrawal of the life force, the sense telephones, as you're going to call them, uh, which we have a little joke about that in SRF. Um, we say that he knew how to transcend dental medication. Get the joke? Yes. Transcend dental medication. Anyway, so Elvis could transcend dental medication along with um, a monk I know who was also able to do that when he went to the dentist. Um, well, to, and, to, to go into that for just a moment before you go into sure, something okay. else. Yeah. Um, so uh, I actually begin the book, my part of the book, you know, after the get through the preface and all of that, the actual chapter one, uh, with a scene that Wanda described to me in one of her letters. She was there, she was present in the room when Elvis was sitting there with a small group of people that he, that he liked, that he trusted. And it was in his home and it would have been in LA cause she never, I don't think she ever went to Memphis. And um, it, there was a large table, I say large, it was a coffee table, but it was long, you know, it was, it was quite long. And there was a big heavy ashtray, one of those big, big old heavy spin 70s ashtrays on one end and he was sitting on the other end of the table. He put out his hand and he brought that ashtray right across the table to him. 
from and three he, to nine. Yeah, he just it just flew across the table, you know, just because he was focusing on it. And when it got in front of him, he just sort of shook himself. He looked a little pale, and he left the room. Right, and he wouldn't, you know, he display those abilities occasionally. I mean, he say turn the lights off in the room, and their blue sparks would shoot from yeah. his. Sparks, yeah, uh huh, yeah, know, yeah. And he'd go out and raise his hands and stop a thunderstorm. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. eyewitnesses so make of it what you will, but it's a consistent pattern. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, but he would also say, "Hey, don't don't be calling me the king. There's only one king. And that's Jesus." Yeah, yeah. He and, was very humble, and he didn't do this a lot, but you know, there were occasions. And um, what was the other one I was going to share? Oh, yes, and this is in the book. Uh, so Wanda's asleep. One, at night, you know, okay, so she's got this little, little dog, it's a real dog, <laughs> but it's a little, you know, I don't know, Pomeranian or something, and it's sleeping on the bed with her, and all of a sudden, she hears Elvis's voice, she's in, she's in LA, and he's in Memphis right then, okay, she hears Elvis's voice go, Wanda, and she's going, uh -huh. she wakes up, and the little dog goes, Eek! <laughs> and runs under the bed, <laughs> and she looks around like, my God, you know, and, and so she finally gets back to sleep. In the morning, the phone rings, and Elvis, it, it, it's Elvis. He just starts laughing. He said, I scared you, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, here we got this prankster. You know, he was, he was a heck of a prankster, you know. And, and sometimes he would use his remarkable abilities, telekinesis, remote audio, you know, all these things that... Um, you know, it, it, to me, it, it plays into his knowing that he was different. He had these visitations from these beings, you know, from the time he was a child. He felt that he was different. He had abilities people didn't have. When he went in to record at Sun Records and they said, well, okay, so who do you sound like? You know, are you going to say you're Nat King Cole or something? You're, you're you know, who are you? Uh, and he said, I don't sound like anybody. You know, he knew. I like uh, nobody. I don't sound like nobody. I don't like nobody. <laughs> right? And, uh, and so what, what we want to do, what we are doing, is to bring this aspect of Elvis um, to the public to be integrated into his full impact. And, yeah, he had his flaws. He wasn't a saint. But he was a he was a special soul. He was a very good man, a very loving man. Um, and the full impact of of Elvis, in terms of the cultural, spiritual, social, civil rights revolution that was sparked not by him alone, but without him, without Elvis. I mean, the whole merging of black and white culture through, through rock and roll, the emergence of the Beatles. And, you know, you look up the Beatles in Wikipedia and it'll just say right up there, the cultural, spiritual, and social impact of the Beatles is almost impossible to overestimate. And you'll see the same in any good evaluation of Elvis because John Lennon came out and said it several times. Without Elvis, there would never have been the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Just, you know he was their inspiration and their idol. And uh, there's an interview out there somewhere with George Harrison in which George is describing going backstage at Madison Square Garden to see Elvis in 1970, 71. And George was really big at that time. He was always big as a Beatle, right? But he just released All Things Must Pass, his, you know, his triple disc album, my Sweet Lord was a big hit. It's George Harrison, so he gets to go backstage after Elvis's concert to see Elvis. It's not the first time they've met. You know, they met briefly. 64, you know, I believe it was. When the Beatles were on tour. I think they might have met again. And so he get George describing and says, you know, so I'm back in this hallway and there's, I'm waiting and then suddenly, you know, there's all these people coming towards me. I don't know who they are. And then suddenly they sort of part and there's, this caped figure who's, you know, his aura around him. And, and here I am, you know, this little, he describes himself. He says, you know, I'm 
you know, I felt like this little Liverpool street urchin just sort of standing there and up comes Lord Vishnu. <laughs> That's how he described, you know, suddenly being in Elvis's presence, you know, and Elvis was just his normal self, you know, just, hey, George, how you doing? Glad you could come, whatever. But, but he just, you know, George knew. I mean, George was a mystic. George, you know, this was a major soul. And the Beatles, you know, when they visited him in L.A. on their way through, they felt like, wow, we're so glad that we've got each other. Because Elvis just has Elvis, and he's surrounded by all these psychophants, you know, the Memphis Mafia, all these uh, backstabbing, um, you know, um, yes men. And uh, they said, well, thank God we've got each other to keep us sane, because the pressure of being Elvis without anybody to talk to must have been terrible. And that's why the phone friends, that's why Wanda, that's yeah. why the book, that's why his need to you know because here's this great soul and he says on the tapes and it's in the book and he, he he says my inner self my spiritual being is hungry for contact with other people's spiritual selves and inner beings and i can't get in that position my career won't allow it my fans won't allow it my management my, my friends won't allow it and i said and i don't meet many people that i can really connect with and it's driving me crazy. It's driving me crazy. He says, uh, I'm going to end up a blundering fool if I don't solve this somehow. And then very poignantly, he says, well, maybe time will solve it. Time has a way of doing that. So that's how we feel that just like Elvis said to Wanda, you know, a time will come when you will know You'll understand things. You'll see a bigger picture. There are time when you and I know each other for a reason, and it will come out. Just like Anwar Sadat said to Mary Kelly, there will come a time when you will understand. And I always said, then portals will open, and people will have a greater understanding of their, their purpose and their, their being. And that time is now, we believe. And that's why we're sharing this with you. And as time goes on, we'll share more of yes there's a, a documentary in the works based on uh the book and the recordings and so we'll share more of that with you at the appropriate time um is there anything else that maya that you feel needs to be shared in yeah this yes there is. Um, and you know this is this is a sadder darker note but i feel it needs to be understood because there's a big gaping hole in, in the picture of Elvis. It's like, well, if he was so spiritual and so beautiful, why did he turn to drugs, you know? And uh, he didn't turn to drugs, uh, not in that convention, the way one might think. First of all, he only took prescription medication. And yes, he became dependent on it, but that was because he, was, he had so many different illnesses. Many of them were genetic, his liver disease, uh, and in the end, he had what he thought was cancer. But after I wrote the book, this this doctor wrote out a thing. He said, I don't think he had cancer. I think he had this. And he wrote this long treatise on it, which is possible. Maybe he had the cancer. Maybe he had this. But in any case, he was in terrible pain, excruciating at times. And the only reason he could go out on stage, he could. He did not take drugs before he went out on stage because he would have been too woozy. So he put himself into a state. But he couldn't do that all the time. Not only that, he had doctors that were encouraging the medication, you know, as much as they could. And um, he had two different doctors. One was in uh, Memphis and the other one was in uh, Las Vegas. This wasn't at the whole time, but toward the end. And they didn't confer. Those doctors didn't confer. So one doctor would give him blah, blah, blah. And then he'd go to Vegas and another doctor would give him blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, he had all these con contradictory drugs in him because of these doctors. And um, it was just a horrible mess. But on top of that, on top of that, the colonel sold Elvis's contract to the mob. And Elvis resisted. This was in 69, but they threatened his, to kill his daughter, his baby, and his father, and whatever, and he, he went along with it. So he was then controlled 
his contract, his entertainment career was controlled not by Colonel Parker, but by the mob. And he had to do what they said, which means he had to work a lot harder. He loved his entertaining work, but he would never have worked himself into the grave, so to speak, like that. But they made him do that, especially when they realized how ill he was. They wanted to get as much out of him as they could. And um, it's very sad. And I don't only know this from Wanda. I knew this before I met Wanda because Janie Steele told me. And I knew another woman who did not know Janie and did not know Wanda, who was there in Vegas. He told me the same story. So this is, this is genuine. And both Janie and this other lady, I've forgotten her name now, told me that they, uh, that, uh, they would drug him on purpose, too. If they wanted to get him to do something or not do something or whatever, they would hold him down and they would drug him. And they witnessed this. Uh, and she heard one of the men say to the other, he's getting harder to hold down these days. She actually heard him say that. So this is so sad, you know. And he was in a situation that was so difficult for him alone. He wasn't the Beatles. He didn't have other people. He had no one, literally, to help him in this situation. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to dwell on it, but I do mention it in my book because it's, it answers th that question. What, what happened, Elvis, as the, as the, the guys wrote that book. And, you know, yeah, it happens. It happens to Elvis. That's what happened, guys. You know? Yeah, it, that's the truth of it. And of course, then when toward the end of his life, and this, he addresses this, um, and I think I have it in the book too, but it's on tape because some, uh, he says that, and this was shortly before his death, but he said, I had to fire them. Fi these guys were stealing from him, stealing from him. He said, I finally had to fire them. And the minute he fired them, they went and wrote the book, you see, and they got a book contract. And, they, and he said, well, some of it is true and a lot of it isn't. And so, um, you know, they mostly just lied, basically, uh, on a few little fragments of truth that they twisted, you know, and whatever. So that began, oh, and they made a lot of money. So then when Elvis died, well, we can make some money too. And some of those, you know, that's the way it went. And they had a field day. And that's why, that's why Wanda and her, and the 15 other phone friends, but maybe it was Wanda's book, but they contributed. Said, we've got to let people know the true Elvis, the Elvis we knew. And that's why they wrote the book. However, uh, you know, she took it to Macmillan and Macmillan wanted to say, well, this is really, yeah, we'll take it. But we want all those tapes to do with put as we please. And we want to, to spice it up a little bit. But we'll give you a lot of money. So that door closed. She said, no way. And so then she decided to have it published by this really small little publishing company in Los Angeles. And unfortunately, they, they cheated her. They, they did or dirty. I don't know exactly the details, but that's why the book didn't get out there. And also, when she would go to uh, the few uh, Elvis, um, uh, you know, gatherings, big gatherings, conventions, that's the word I'm looking for, to sell her book, and she wasn't trying to make money. This was something she was doing for, for Elvis. They all were doing it. The, the money she made from this tiny little company wasn't worth anything, you know, but she went with her book humbly to share it with the fans. Well, the, the guys thought, oh, my God, she's got tapes of Elvis talking to her. What did he say? What did he say about us? You know, which he really didn't bother. But they were terrified. So they spread a lot of nasty lies about her, even about her 16-year-old daughter. And she said, I don't need this. Forget it. And she took her book, and she didn't go back. So very few people read that book. And it was a very thin one. And I did, and that's how I was able to get in touch with her and how everything began. And I've quoted, you know, nice uh, certain passages from her book and mine. Anyway, I, I just wanted to share that. It's a sad tale, but it's true, and it fits into the whole picture. It can't be left out. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. And it, you know, it, it plays into, okay, so... Elvis's contract was sold to the mob and his family was threatened. And so, of course, he had to go along with certain things. But at the same time, Elvis kind of saw himself as a superhero and not, yeah, and, and rather justifiably so. I mean, he makes sparks shoot out of the end of your fingers <laughs> and you can stop the weather and move an ashtray across the table 
and beings of light show up in your kid and tell you you're, you know, from another planet. Okay. Krypton might as well. Right. So when it came to being in this situation where, you know, his, his career was owned by the mob and his family was being threatened. He didn't take it lying down. And, um, you know, the famous photograph of his meeting with president Nixon, he, I mean, there's a movie made about it and it's, you know, it's, it's a really amazing story. He wanted a real legitimate FBI badge as a federal agent to be able to make arrests and cooperate with the FBI specifically, you know, around drugs. And he, you know, it's known he was a great friend to law enforcement. He loved to, you know, collect badges, honorary badges, but he also, you know, I mean, he took it seriously. He'd see somebody speeding and he'd turn on his, he had this red light in his limo and he'd pull him over. Imagine somebody gets pulled over by a limo with a, you know, with a three colored light and up comes Elvis Presley and says, you know, you're driving kind of fast. You need to be more careful. You need to not do that. I'm Elvis Presley and I got a badge. Now you drive slow. <laughs> I, just, I just love that. So, um, you know, so the steps that Elvis took, um, we won't go into them here, but let's just say that, um, he wasn't going to take it lying down in terms of having his life controlled by the mob. And, you know, and that's where for, you know, for those of you who investigate the Elvis lives stories and, and what's behind them, you know, I'm a storyteller. I'd look at, I used to be a story analyst for CBS and, you know, read uh, hundreds of scripts and log lines. Is it a credible premise? This is a credible premise. That's all I'm willing to say about it. Given who he was, the state of his health, the pressures on him, the situation with the mob, his connections to law enforcement. He was an informant. He was an, F an informant for the FBI. Yeah, that, there's a thousand pages of, you know, public information open. Now it's declassified. You can check it out. Um, so, you know, this, the premise exists and is not easily dismissed for somebody like that to go, okay, I need to get out of this situation and, um, you know, fake his death. Um, I'm not prepared to say I know 100% that that's what he did. I will only say that based on the evidence that I've seen, I cannot rule it out. I'd love to be able to rule it out because, um, you know, um, it's a conspiracy theory. But anyway, um, it's it, it just plays into... Whether or not he did it, I don't know whether he did or not, whether he's still around. It'd be an amazing story if it's true. But he is such a remarkable being. And I believe he, if he had decided to do it, he could have pulled it off. Not many people could have. But, um, and I love the idea of him finding peace and, you know, moving on, living the normal human life that he longed to live. He knew he was never going to be normal. He had a special mission. I love the story of that. Whether or not it's true, we'll probably never know. But it, it's part of the whole myth and the whole legend of this amazing, beautiful man. And I am so grateful to Maya for all the, the work that she did to bring the book forward, to Wanda and her daughter, Starla. Um, and we'll share more with you at the appropriate time as um, our project moves forward. And yes, Maya. And I will have a link to where you can buy my book. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. This is uh, definitely a promotional program right here. And I want to say that I did not write this book for Elvis fans. I didn't write it for not Elvis fans, but I wrote it for human beings. And uh, this is not a book that you have to be an Elvis fan to enjoy by any means. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's it's just got amazing passages in it. It's a revelation and it's got a lot of very fascinating, deep metaphysical material, of course, from, from all of, of Maya's work over the years. So thank you for being with us. And of course, if you are able to, um, you know, the, 
Blue Star Rising is a project of the Sacred Alliance of Global Evolution. We welcome donations to support uh, the work we do here to bring all this to you. And we'll have a link down below for that, as well as for Maya's wonderful book, Blue Star Love um, from Heart of Grace. Thanks. And if, you're, if you're, if you're uh, wanting to have a session with me, uh, Kashik session, see what past uh, lives yeah, might course. be related to you. Well, I'm here. And available. A little blurb <laughs> video um, about that and uh, get, get directly in touch with Maya at Maya at newearthstar.org. M-A-I-A. <laughs> M-A-I-A, right, Maya at newearthstar.org. So God blesses everyone. We'll, we'll see you next time, folks. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Thank you.